In the fall of 1987, at the age of 26, I asked my father, Minoru Fukushima, for the first time about his childhood. This is his story. I can't recollect anything when the war started. No Hitler, no Pearl Harbor, nothing. I was just having fun, you know, being a kid, being a regular nine-year-old. Canadian kid growing up in Vancouver over my parents' grocery store, 477 Powell Street. They had tobaccos and vegetables and fruit, an ice cream soda fountain and candy. My mom sold candy. My dad, he delivered milk, so he was pretty well known in that Vancouver Japanese community. They ran the store for almost 20 years from when they came to Canada till, well, till we were interned. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. On December 8, they attacked Hong Kong. Long-standing anti-Japanese sentiments were ignited, compelling the Canadian government to declare that arising out of war with Japan, it is deemed necessary for the security and defense of Canada to conduct the evacuation of every person of Japanese race from British Columbia. Envious and resentful competitors of Japanese Canadian merchants, farmers and fishermen convinced the government to seize all Japanese property with a mandate to eventually liquidate, sell, or otherwise dispose of such property. They confiscated everything. The government took everything. The grocery store, brand new milk truck. They said held in trust, but we never got it back. So it must have been sold or whatever. Dad never really talked about it, you know. My parents shielded us from all that. So, I mean, I don't even remember going to the camp at New Denver. It was a train, but the next thing I remember is we were in a tent at New Denver wooden floor, and a tent. But then living in under a tent, I guess, was a novelty, you know? It felt like a real camp, middle of the Rocky Mountains, right in front of a big lake and a ball field. I remember that's where I learned how to swim. It was just like growing up anywhere else. Inside the camp. There wasn't a fence as such, not a barbed wire. But we were in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. There was nowhere to go. In August of 1944, while Japanese Canadians were still isolated from the world in internment camps in the BC interior, Prime Minister Mackenzie King proclaimed his commitment to democracy. We must not permit in Canada the hateful doctrine of racialism, the basis of the Nazi system, but protect the people of British Columbia, the interests of the country, and preserve principles of fairness and justice. On August 6, 1945, the world's first atomic bomb destroyed Hiroshima. 
nine days later, the war was over. Japan surrendered. By December of that year, a full four months after the end of the war, the Canadian government, responding to pressure from British Columbia politicians and public opinion, kept a wartime promise that for the security and welfare of Canada, every naturalized Japanese Canadian, every natural born Japanese Canadian, could and should be deported to Japan. Whereas the internment had been paid for through the sale of Japanese Canadian property and assets, transport for the deportation was guaranteed by the Canadian government. An official policy of dispersal forced the remaining Japanese Canadians out of British Columbia into any part of the country that had not yet barred them. The choice for my grandfather was between a country that would never accept him or a Japan barely remembered after 25 years in Canada. I was 13 when the war ended. We'd heard about Toronto and Calgary and other cities banning the Japanese, and we had to choose between going to Japan or labor out east. Manitoba or Alberta beef farms, I think. Vancouver wasn't an option. We had to leave BC. So that was a choice. Dad's choice. We all disagreed with Dad, but we obeyed our parents, and that was just a normal thing. Besides, my dad wouldn't have asked us. He would have just told us, we're going to Japan. We didn't know what it was really, going to Japan or going to the interior or going somewhere else. There was no going home though. Even at that age, we knew Vancouver was restricted, except to ship us out. We left the camp the fall of 46, onto a troop ship in Vancouver and landed in Yokosuka Japanese Naval Base. It seemed like forever. Then we were herded into army barracks. The food was brought in buckets. We ended up in my grandfather's village, small, real poor, middle of nowhere. And we weren't very welcome. Dad's family gave us a barn to live and a rice field to work. Life was hard after the war for the Japanese, and they saw us as a burden. We were resented because we weren't Japanese. So I went to school to learn Japanese. <laughs> I had grade eight from New Denver, but only spoke English. So I was in school with the grade one kids, and I was 14. <laughs> I stayed in school about a year, just a year. Then back to rice fields. Conscious of the impending United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, the Canadian government cancelled its deportation and dispersal orders on January 24, 1947.
March 31, 1949, signaled the last of the federal government restrictions on Japanese Canadians, thereby allowing unrestricted travel and permitting settlement anywhere within Canada. When we were deported to Japan, my oldest brother, George, was 18. He could have stayed in Canada, but he came with us. So when he heard about the orders being rescinded, his resentment to Canada just got bigger and bigger. He knew then just how much had been taken, from us kids especially. Beet farm wouldn't have been any worse than rice farm. And at least it was Canada. For me, it was destiny. We're there, we're in Japan, live as a Japanese. Not ever in my wildest dreams thought that I'd ever be back in Canada. In 1950, the United Nations sent a multinational armed force into Korea in what it called a policing action against communist North Korean aggressions. The Canadian government provided troops to the UN effort, and the Canadian Army in Japan recruited those Canadians exiled in 1946. Almost 40 exiles volunteered. In 1950, I turned 18. I remember something in the paper said the Canadian Army was looking for us who still had Canadian citizenship to join to fight in Korea for the United Nations and Canada. I must have wondered, you know, how come they forced us to Japan? And now they were recruiting us to fight. I mean, Canada only ever saw me as Japanese, but I'd always been a Canadian. So the Canadian Army, I guess, was how I saw getting back to the only home I knew or didn't know. I mean, I only had the two memories of Canada, Vancouver growing up, and then internment camps. That was it. But Japan had been my dad's decision. This was my first chance, my own choice. I never hesitated at all. After I enlisted, my father told me that if he had known what it was like in Japan after the war, he would have never brought us to Japan. That was his greatest regret. So he was happy when I joined. I remember he was glad. You see, my parents could never have afforded to bring us home. They had nothing. They never got anything for their store or property. All they got, my parents got, was just sent us on the boat to Japan. I wonder sometimes about the justice. In 1942, the Canadian government labeled me an enemy, sent me into exile. To a nine-year-old child, it seemed just another part of growing up, a part of life. But children don't know right or wrong. I mean, interning us during the war, giving us that narrow alternative of either going to Japan or going where we were sent. I thought it happened to everyone. 
not just the Japanese. In 1953, after Korea, I got to come back and be a Canadian to start over, to have justice in a way. My father came home and rebuilt his life. In the process, Many things were left, best forgotten and unspoken. Those silences are a large part of my identity, my other heritage. But my Canadianness is complete, totally natural, immutable. My father affirmed his in the face of hatred and oppression. I am a Canadian because he struggled to remain a Canadian. On September 22nd, 1988, the Canadian government acknowledged the injustices committed against Japanese Canadians during and after World War II. A comprehensive settlement was achieved, which included symbolic redress payments to eligible persons still alive on September 22, 1988, a community activities fund, and the establishment of a Canadian Race Relations Foundation. My grandmother, widowed for 12 years, died one year earlier, in August of 1987.